the Ganges River, Jerusalem, Mount Olympus. The notion of a holy land or a sacred place is altogether normal to human religions. People wage war over it. People die over it. Because it has never occurred to them, or perhaps they're unable to grasp the idea that location is an illusion. What makes a place that place? Surely it's not the space that it takes up in outer space, because Earth is rotating at roughly a thousand miles an hour, while soaring around the sun at 67,000 miles an hour, while blazing through outer space at, well, that depends on your reference point. Because velocity is relative. Galaxies blaze through the universe and collide into each other. New stars and planets form daily and old ones are engulfed by their home stars. All this in a universe that is itself expanding. Relative to other locations on Earth, cities move. The very tectonic plates they rest on are shifting, shuffling the continents around, albeit incredibly gradually, creating mountains and islands where there were once oceans. Shorelines erode. Rivers carve out canyons, entire towns are buried by volcanoes and mudslides. Winds blow away topsoil and bury ancient ruins in dust. Trees die and erode while new foliage grows to replace it, nourished by water from clouds formed halfway across the planet. Every molecule on Earth is being stirred around like a planetary bowl of porridge. Entire cities are abandoned or leveled by war. Houses are remodeled brick by brick. New buildings made from internationally imported materials rise up to replace old ones. From a human perspective, in this moment, this brief snapshot in time, each location feels fixed. It feels constant. But revisit a booming city 80 years later and you'll barely recognize it. Imagine an omnipresent, omniscient, eternal entity exists. Knowing all of this, the thought that it would label something so dynamic as a holy land is laughable. And if you think otherwise, then your god is too small, too human in its delusions. Holy land? Holy dirt? Holy trees? Holy buildings? What part of a constantly changing land is holy? And where is it? Let's imagine for a moment that I'm interacting with a theist. Though lacking evidence, for the purpose of thought experiment, I'll charitably grant her the existence of a god. To make matters more fun, I'll take it one step further, and though demonstrably false, I'll assume all the legends of the Judeo-Christian god to be true. Now, I just have one blaring question. Why are people made of meat? Why did God make us edible? If we're given dominion over the world, and we're supposed to fill the earth and subdue it, then why are we walking meat sacks? Most of us are jerky bites, but even Hopthor Bjornsson is just a family-sized meal to a hungry lion pride. We're constantly being eaten by bacteria, parasites like mosquitoes, and for much of our history, wild animals. If God exists, he is clearly the greatest troll alive tells man to rule over the animal kingdom and makes him out of animal food. This would be the equivalent of telling a sentient gummy bear to watch a daycare. Trace the genealogies of the Bible back to Adam, and if he's passing DNA to his offspring, it can only be assumed that he was made of meat too. But why? Did God anticipate Adam's fall and create him meaty from the get-go, destining his lineage to brutal ending after brutal ending as tasty snacks? <laughs> And if Adam was made in the image of God, is God made of meat? If so, maybe he could lend us a little toe or something and end world hunger. You'd think having existed forever, he would have digitized himself after a while. If he was remotely loving, why couldn't he have done the same for us, instead of making us delicious to parasites? The fact that we're made of meat makes perfect sense from an evolutionary standpoint. We're made of the most common elements in the universe, which we can observe forming through nuclear fusion all around us in stars far and wide. We're made of the same organic molecules that we've observed self-forming without any assistance in a plethora of conditions under close observation in laboratories. Every living creature on Earth is made of these exact same ingredients. We've observed so many of the stages of abiogenesis and evolution, from simple chemical evolution to the formation of multicellular colonies to endosymbiosis to speciation and the development of new traits. Every living organism is coated with the same molecular building blocks, DNA, and every organism shares DNA in common. So it makes sense that we're because food is just the proteins, carbs, and fats that we're all made of, which can be rearranged in our bodies to perform different essential functions.
reactions. Plants and animals are made of the same stuff we are. That's why we eat them. And we're made of the same stuff that they are, which is why they eat us. But computers and robots don't need to eat food. They don't need to drink water or breathe. They can run on electricity. They can exist in extreme cold and don't require sleep. We already know that they can massively outperform a human in almost every kind of calculation and continue to improve exponentially. There's no reason to believe that if given the right kind of sensors and structuring its digital mind correctly, that a robot wouldn't be able to have feelings and emotions too. And it wouldn't be food. The only reason to cover a robot in food Westworld style would be to make it more aesthetically pleasing to savages like us, to avoid the uncanny valley creep factor of people-ish robots. We're insecure, as we should be, because we're edible, and we're vulnerable. And if there was a god made of food, I would completely understand its extreme insecure necessity for dominance and worship. Silent Green is God! The revelation of the God of the Bible comes through the Jewish people. That's why they're chosen. That's what they were chosen for. Are the Jews still God's chosen people today? No. Today, Christians are God's chosen people. A Cincinnati lawyer claims it's his duty to represent a group of white supremacists because he believes, quote, white people are the chosen people. We are the real chosen people. If you happen to be Jewish, or if you happen to be Christian, or if you happen to be Muslim, there is some aspect of that in our sense of who we are as religious people. Every time I open my web browser and see some evangelist talking about Israel or some white supremacist talking about racial supremacy, it always seems to come back to the idea of being God's chosen people. I get it. You wanna feel special, but chosen people? Chosen? People? Chosen people? The notion of a divinely chosen people or race is a mere hog dropping away from utter nonsense. What sane creator of all people would even draw those lines? Hey, you know how I created these talking monkeys with overactive amygdalas and a tribalistic in-group out-group mentality? Let's tell one of these violent primate subgroups that they're special, deserve to conquer and rule the world and have our blessing to do so. Whatever could possibly go wrong? The idea of a chosen people is so arrogantly anthropocentric it makes Trump's ego look fun-sized. What makes our planet significant to begin with? Why in space would pea-brained animalistic humans be considered special by the creator of billions of stars and planets far grander and more magnificent than our own? We are on this remote, minuscule floating rock, and half of us can't even figure out the right way to flip the toilet paper roll. It's over, by the way. You flip it over. And if you don't agree, then you're probably the reason that Jersey Shore has more watch time than Cosmos. If an advanced godlike alien civilization were to look down on us, they'd likely laugh and smirk. They just entered the nuclear age. How cute. We'll come back when they've evolved one giant interconnected internet brain, if they don't blow themselves up first. We share 98% of our DNA with poop-throwing chimpanzees, and we have even more DNA in common with each other. At what point in our evolution did God decide that our races were ever so slightly different enough to pick one of us to be his fave? And how did he draw the blurry lines? Does God look at bloodlines? Then why does every race of people all have the same blood types? Blood banks no longer segregate blood by the donor's race, like they did during World War II. We know better now. If you've ever had an emergency surgery and needed a blood transfusion, chances are you received blood from someone of another race than you, and your body accepted it just fine. And if that happened, you should be grateful because they saved your life. Perhaps God picks a favorite by discriminating based on skin color, which is heavily influenced by melanin content, fluxing from person to person, as well as the amount of sunlight exposure, tanning beds, etc. And if so, then mixed race people must really give God a cranial contortion. Does he subjectively prefer Indians, light-skinned blacks, or dark-skinned Latinos more in this imaginary hierarchy of chosenness? Even cultures that isolate themselves and try their best to keep their bloodlines pure show internally significant changes between individuals due to gene duplication, genetic mutation, epigenetics, and horizontal gene transfer. If God really wanted the bloodlines that pure, incest would be his greatest boon to mankind. Instead, narrow gene pools are the best way to acquire genetic defects. Perhaps God's a eugenicist, choosing his people based on head shape or nose structure, in which case head binding cultures must really throw him off, and plastic surgeons hold the keys to your heavenly mansion, for which your nose job may be a prerequisite. Or do you have to chop a chunk of your God-chosen man noodle off to play for the winning team? Maybe God chooses his favorite people based on their linguistic inheritance, in which case maybe I'll become a polyglot fluent in 12 languages so that I can please the whims of a dozen nations finicky deities. But if that's the case, 
then why do languages evolve, morph, and dilute so much? Even the French can't keep their language from changing, and boy do they try. And if one of the gods really chose one race, why all the confusion over which one it is? The Jews think that they're God's chosen people, pan-Arab nationalists think that they have some kind of divine destiny, Russians have the notion of Sviatia Rus, or Holy Russia, as well as the idea that Moscow was determined by God to be the third Rome. Most of the British Commonwealth have the notion that they're God's own country. Germans have Zandaweg and Ubermensch, Rastafarians have their own notions of divine grandeur, and for Americans it was manifest destiny and the white man's burden. But if whiteys make God grin, then Nigerians with albinism must really give him the giggle fits. Go far enough back and we all emerged out of Africa. And mass migration, immigration, and interracial marriages have blended us all together into one human race. The best demonstration of this is when KKK members get their DNA tests back, showing that they're part Jewish, Mexican, and black. While isolation and evolution account for minor differences between the races, here's where it gets really crazy. If you go back one generation, your parents, you share them in common with your siblings. You go back two generations and you share ancestors with your cousins. The further back you go, the bigger this tree becomes and the more modern day people you share ancestors with. You go back a hundred generations, just a couple thousand years, and you share at least one ancestor with every single person on earth, even accounting for isolated inbred societies. A little further back and you share every single ancestor with every other person on earth. Sure, some lineages have died out, but that means that if you go enough generations back, you'll eventually hit a point where you, everyone in Nigeria, everyone in Japan, everyone in Chile, and the entire world share every single ancestor in common with each other. Slight differences in skin color, nose shape, eye color, hair color, and texture have occurred through genetic mutation. But nevertheless, all of us are remarkably similar, and we're all related. Whether it's Queen Hatshepsut in Egypt, King David in Israel, or Emperor Wu of the Han Dynasty in China, you're probably related to one or all of them. Follow their ancestry back another thousand years or two, and you definitely are. So if race is a human construct on the basis of minuscule superficial differences, then on what basis would a god play favorites? Cultural practices and traditions? If so, what practices? Circumcision, which is practiced by Jews, Muslims, and some Christians, not eating beef, which I guess in that case, the vegetarians could slip in on the Hindu ticket. Some pastors say it's based on belief, but we don't get to choose where we're born. What if we're brought up in the wrong religion? And if we've never even been exposed to a different religion or even encountered evidence against the religion we're brought up in, then do we really have a free choice? Our cultures are so heavily interconnected that one afternoon on Imgur or Reddit will drop kick you with the realization that none of your experiences are unique to you and you share them with people all around the world. Even something a signature to a nation as K-pop is nothing but an amalgamation of other cultural influences. While this is a gross simplification, this distinctly Korean phenomenon, captured by hardware manufactured in China by a German company founded by a Swiss businessman, is then mixed down in an American DAW. The Japanese cameras shoot moves influenced heavily by MTV and by African American hip hop culture that are performed by dancers rocking the latest European threads. Afterwards, they probably go out for Middle Eastern shawarmas at Mr. Kebab in downtown Seoul. Our world is becoming more and more interconnected. And that's a good thing. The realization that we're all one race, the human race, and the need for peace for mutually beneficial trading to take place has led to when you stop and add up the numbers, the most peaceful century in history, even with two world wars. Cryptocurrency is pushing for a decentralization of money. The third world is rapidly rising or has risen out of poverty. International trade agreements and free movement zones have made borders begin to disintegrate with a few obvious exceptions. International languages have brought us closer together, and ongoing advances in instantaneous translation software and hardware promise to make language barriers a thing of the past. So while religion threatens to divide us on the knife edge of racial differences, science and technology show us just how similar we all are, and promise to bring humanity even closer together. With ideas, languages, religions, and cultures mixing and melting in a never-ending dynamic game of musical pairs, what part of a constantly changing interweaving chosen people is chosen. And what makes it singular? You're not chosen, but that's actually extremely liberating. You're under no obligation to be God's anointed. Instead, we can come together under our own volition to fight for the future of humanity. Because when you really stop and take a step back, ethnic differences are only skin deep.
The other day, I saw a meme posted by a Christian about the stages of evolution of a Christian, where the end result is falling to your knees and begging for mercy in worship of a god. And I think that the longer it's been since I left my faith, the more dumbfounded I am by the things that religious people post, by the things they celebrate. This is in no way an evolution. Allow me to explain. When I was a missionary kid, I used to go to worship services all the time. Everyone would sing, some people would raise their hands, and one guy in particular in the front row would go all out, getting on his knees or sometimes lying face down on the ground in a display of total subjugation before God. And the image stuck with me, but it wasn't until later, much later, that I really grasped how utterly ironic this was. Singing songs about how God is love, great is his faithfulness, his mercies endure forever, he's Abba, he's Father, he's Dad, while assuming a slave position. Because that's what this is, making yourself small and non-threatening, easy to cuff or subdue, bowing your head to avoid eye contact, getting on the ground, and putting your hands up in total submission, as though trying to avoid the wrath of a tyrannical king who could fly off the handle at any moment, as though attempting to appease a narcissistic and abusive partner. It's a normalization of the slave-master mentality. It is not a healthy father-child relationship. In fact, if you saw a parent forcing their kid to prostrate themselves on the ground in worship before them, you would call CPS, because this is not the image of a tender-hearted father that you can confide in, who listens to your worries and, without judgment, simply hugs you and says, I sure do love you, Pumpkin. It's gonna be okay. It's the image of Ivan the Terrible, a tyrannical czar who in a fit of rage flew off the handle and murdered his own son because there was no other way to appease his wrath. Sure, there are plenty of verses in the Bible about how God is slow to anger and abounding in love. God is love. And if you cherry pick out just these verses, you know, the ones they like to highlight in church, you could easily dismiss me as someone who hasn't ever read the Bible. But if you dig deeper, you read the entire thing, a picture begins to emerge of an easily angered monster, who claims to love the world, but wipes out an entire planet in a global flood, who claims to oppose a single murder, but repeatedly commands his own people to commit genocide. Uh, like, did you know that there's a story in 2 Samuel 6 of a priest named Uzzah who's helping bring the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem on an ox cart, and when the oxen trips, the Ark starts to slide off the cart and Uzzah reaches up to stabilize it, but the second he touches God's shiny trinket, God strikes him dead in a fit of rage. And in case you forgot, the Ark of the Covenant was the golden box that housed the Ten Commandments. You know, the ones that said, thou shalt not kill? So we have a God of love, and there is no fear in love, yet if you know what's good for you, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. What an absolute mindfuck. If his mercies truly know no end, then why would he intentionally create an eternal torture chamber as punishment for finite sins against him? If he, quote, desires mercy, not sacrifice, then why does he need a blood sacrifice as penance for not being born perfect? And why does he need you to believe it at all for the purifying magic to work? What a warped labyrinthian mind game of contradictions and doublespeak. Telling someone without me you're nothing, who are you that you can relate to me, you'll fear me if you know what's best for you, is abusive and narcissistic. So when Christians who've never even read their Bible cover to cover descend into my comments to tell me that I'm mistaken and crazy because everyone knows that God is love, well you can fuck right off with that gaslighting hogwash. A loving parent picks their kids up off the ground. They desire to see their children thrive and succeed and even surpass their own accomplishments. They're not threatened by their children. Oh, and fear and corporal punishment are incredibly ineffective ways of teaching a child. Your children are not your subjects, and healthy parents don't need praise and worship. Only the incredibly insecure do. Demanding worship is not something you do if you're confident and secure in yourself. It's something you do if you're weak and you need to enforce order or boost your fragile ego. So Christians, when you post memes like this, just know that this is not the image of empowerment. It is not evolution by any stretch of the word. It is the sad and backwards devolving of a strong, proud human into a pathetic and terrified slave. But you are not a slave. Cast off these shackles because you can be free. Dare to be curious, but don't drink the Kool-Aid. Never have one of those moments where you're revisiting something from your past 
something that used to feel so normal, benign, or even positive at the time. But when you re-encounter or reflect back on it years later, you suddenly realize just how messed up it actually was. Like, when you joke about your childhood trauma, assuming that everyone experienced the same thing, but instead of laughing, the whole room just goes silent and everyone gives you sad eyes. Or when you go back and watch an old comedy show that really didn't age well. Or you read through your old journal entries or social media posts and suddenly realize that you've actually come a long way, but used to parrot some pretty ignorant ideas and possess some kind of backwards perspectives. And sure, if we're constantly learning and growing, I think that's normal, and at every point in our life, future us won't be able to look back at current us without having a tinge of the cringe. Over the last decade or so of deconstructing my faith, I've had a lot of those moments where a religious idea that sounded so totally normal in the presence of new information becomes jaw-droppingly awful. Ideas which I was once conditioned to believe, even cherish, suddenly, I start to see them in a very different light. One such example happened to me just recently here in Brazil. There was a specific Christian idea which was instilled in me repeatedly since childhood, which I once yearned and hoped for as a Christian, but that I now realize is incredibly dark, toxic, and actually a bit of a nightmare. What's up everybody, right now I am in Rio de Janeiro behind the iconic Christ the Redeemer statue. Now, don't get me wrong, I love it here in Brazil, and this monument is extremely impressive, but no matter where I go in this city, this gigantic religious monument hovers overhead, staring down from his lofty perch. It watches as I wander the city, watches me eat breakfast, it even feels like Jesus is watching me poop. That's Assuming he can see through walls. Don't worry, I'm not going crazy. Yet. But it does kind of make me wonder if Statue Jesus X-ray vision is thwarted by sheets of lead like Superman's. Harrison? Harrison! Six! You better not be going in there to fuck again. Three! Oh no you don't! Tissue? Raised in the church, time and time again, I heard pastors celebrate God's omnipresence and omniscience, quoting verses where God says things like, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, watching the evil and the good. Behold, I am with you always. Or, He said, Never will I leave you, and never will I forsake you. This is God's promise. I'm watching you, Wazowski. Always watching. Growing up in youth group, we even sang a song with the lyrics, Where can I run from your presence? Where can I run? Which comes from a psalm talking about how no matter where you try to flee from God, you can't escape him. And even if you just want to be left alone, so you take to the skies or make off to the underworld, even there, his quote, right hand will take hold of me. Several years back, I was in a pretty emotionally abusive relationship with an anxious partner who didn't care much for healthy boundaries. And I remember googling signs you're in an emotionally abusive relationship while I was sitting on the toilet with my phone, because that was the only time that I had any semblance of privacy. And after just five minutes, she pounded on the door and accused me of trying to get away from her by taking long poops. I didn't realize just how unhealthy that dynamic was, because not too many years before that, I was straight up rejoicing at God's all-seeing nature and took comfort in the fact that he was always there with me no matter what. And for us naive little youth group kids, God was an ever-present, tender-hearted father. But while healthy parents respect their kids' autonomy and teach them to become more independent, God wasn't just around to turn to if you were hurting, lost, or confused. He was constantly there holding your hand, like it or not. A crutch for loneliness, a personal backseat speed trap comp. And yet we viewed it as an ever-present comfort in times of trouble. In a way, kind of like jolly old Saint Nick. He sees you when you're sleeping. Okay, admittedly, the lyrics of that Christmas song make Santa seem creepy as hell. But if you stop and think about it, the portrayal of the Christian God is so so much worse. Instead of a jolly old man who brings gifts for the good children, this god demands unending, groveling worship. And instead of the bad kids just missing out or maybe getting a lump of coal in a sock, which their mom has to wash later, he also benevolently punishes these naughty kiddos with torture and hellfire forever. A punishment entirely disproportionate to the finite crime committed. Unless they repent of everything that they've ever done and worship the very ground that he walks 
attacks on. Sure, Christians might retort that he's there to mercifully save them, but to save them from who? Who is it that they believe is keeping score, tallying up their every misdeed? Who is it that wrote the rules that they have to live by? Who is it that they believe made this entire system, rigged in such a way where they were born sinful, doomed to fail, and commanded to be perfect? It makes us objects in a cruel experiment whereby we are created sick and then ordered to be well. An impossible feat under pain of eternal torture. And just who exactly do they claim made this eternally scorched prison for them in the first place? Oh, but that's not fair. He showed just how deep his love was for us by killing his own son for a couple days. <laughs> Forgive me for not being impressed by the oh-so-benevolent mercies of this mythological monster that they choose to worship, but I didn't ask him to do that. I didn't ask to be born. Did I have a say? in original sin? I'm sorry, but all of this feels pretty non-consensual to me. Because this, my friends, is not what a kind, healthy relationship looks like. This Christian take on God normalizes narcissistic abuse, because they're taught that it's the embodiment of goodness, even how God behaves. This teaches Christian children to cling to an absolute egomaniacal psychopath and tells them that they can never escape his domineering presence. It makes countless Christians blind to this kind of abuse. Without even realizing it, otherwise loving parents are normalizing unhealthy behavior to their children, and their children are being groomed for toxic relationships. Because in one-on-one -on -one situations, this kind of behavior is psychological and emotional abuse. At scale, it's textbook, fear-based authoritarianism. And it would make me wonder if this was where Orwell got his inspiration from, except that Orwell's dystopia was a mild frolic in a field of dandelions when juxtaposed next to this never-ending barbaric nightmare. At least Big Brother couldn't read people's thoughts, or judge them for feeling anger, or damn them for having oh-so-harmful, lust-filled fantasies play out on the privacy of their own cranial jelly. Do we really want everything we've ever done? every thought we've ever had but never acted on, to be logged and recorded, remembered and used against us? Is this really a fantasy worth craving? And before any of you rattle off some BS retort of, well, if you've got nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear, tell me that you've never had a shameful intrusive thought that wouldn't go away, or done something inappropriate, embarrassing, or messed up in some way that you wish you could forget. Getting called out for such actions in public is the absolute worst. Worst. But can you imagine if every single wrong thing that we did, said, or thought was logged for divine sentencing, if you were made to feel worse than dirt for being the filthy sinner that you were created as? But then you're at least oh so mercifully given the opportunity to grovel and worship before the all-seeing watcher. Somehow that doesn't really feel like a gift. And yet this is exactly what most Christians I know believe and yearn for. It's the hand they reveal when they gleefully blurt out to an unconvinced atheist that, you'll see, when you're burning in hell, you'll see. And yet almost no Christian that I know seems to really grasp the consequences of having an omnipresent judge. So they engage in wishful thinking, hoping, believing that the endorphin-induced goosebumps and butterflies that they get when they force themselves to believe hard enough are somehow evidence that God is currently with them. But my God am I glad that a goosebump is just a goosebump, and a shiver down my spine isn't some supernatural entity tickling my backbone. Because isn't social media bad enough? I mean, hell, I can't tell you how many times I've seen someone canceled for posting something politically incorrect to their feed, and thought to myself just how lucky I was that these platforms weren't around to capture my dark, unfiltered high school humor. Because who hasn't said or done something that they regretted and wished that they could forget? Who hasn't gotten away with something that they're now ashamed of? And I don't mean wiping a booger under the desk or farting in an elevator and blaming it on a kid, or hiding your morning wood in church with a Bible. On a side note, I'm convinced that 90% of guys who hold their Bibles like this while singing in church are actually hiding awkward boners. Until recently, the notion that everything we do could be recorded, analyzed, and punished was laughably infeasible. Even the Snowden leaks about the NSA revealed that there was so much data captured, but not nearly enough manpower to process all of it. 1984's version, with someone watching a two-way TV in every house, would have required unscalable manpower. 
But with the rise of AI, sensors and mics on every phone, and cameras on every street corner, this dystopia grows ever closer. Hell, in parts of China, with their ever-growing social credit system tracking the population's every move, it's rapidly nearing reality. But China doesn't threaten eternal hellfire. They might if they could, who knows. But the Christian god does. And Christians are okay with it even take comfort in it at times. They grovel and beg for forgiveness and tearfully confess their every sin before a divine creator. To my American audience, I just have to ask, if you're conservative and you care about my freedom, if you believe that the Second Amendment exists to safeguard against authoritarianism, that every human has a right to privacy, and that the government shouldn't be able to illegally search your home, why the hell do you find the thought of an omnipresent cop comforting and just Think about how absurd this thought is. Do you give half a damn about the thoughts of an ant or the actions of an amoeba? Highly advanced aliens probably don't visit Earth simply because we're too primitively stupid and insignificant for them to even take interest. Just how egocentric do we have to be to believe that an infinitely powerful, all-knowing, ever-present deity gives two shits that you touch yourself at night? Dylan. Or the fact that I just said a naughty word. Gasp. Look, when you live with a partner or a family member long enough, you inevitably come face to face with their flaws. And in a healthy relationship, you learn to understand, forgive, and accept each other. You know that underneath that skin sack is an imperfect human being just like you. With big flaws, but an even bigger heart. And sure, it's nice if they apologize for their messes, but you don't require them to grovel and beg for forgiveness. And choosing to forgive them doesn't make you worthy of worship. Good people choose to see the good in other people because good people know that they themselves make mistakes too. And this world sure as hell could use more compassion. We don't need the threat of an all-seeing eye or omnipresent overlord to keep us in check. We screw up, we learn, we grow. That's not to say that actions should never have consequences, and sometimes our screw-ups are embarrassing as hell. But other times, we're grateful that nobody caught what we said. Others tend to quickly forget our most humbling moments, even as we continue to beat ourselves over the head for it. And this social shame is usually bad enough. It's a brutal teacher that keeps us pining over our failures long after everyone around us has forgotten all about them. Our loved ones just forgive us. They don't need a blood sacrifice to do it. We move forward, doing our best to be better people, learning to show grace to the other imperfect screw-ups that we surround ourselves with. And we do all of that out of a desire to grow and a love for others, not because someone's always watching. And sure, if you don't believe in hell but buy into a more soft, loving, teddy bear of a Jesus, it would be nice to know that we had an all-powerful, loving father helping us through life's difficult moments. But think of it so, every time that you thought God gave you strength or guidance, that was actually you. You reached down deep. You pulled it out from within yourself. Because you are an incredible badass, capable of so much more than you know. When you needed guidance, that trusty voice in your head was your intuition. And when others came at just the right time to help you, they weren't magically sent from God. You simply experienced the kindness of others. Because that is what true healthy, actual kindness looks like. If you are a Muslim, Christian, or other theist looking to bolster the arguments for your faith, there are a ton of erroneous arguments out there that you should avoid. But today we're going to focus on one often used line of theistic reasoning that's particularly egregious. Let's assume for a moment that you're convinced that the universe has a creator. A big bang needs a big banger. Why does that creator have to be an all-powerful god? Here are seven possible alternatives to an all-powerful god that you may never have even thought of. Hi, I'm Thomas Westbrook, a former evangelical Christian missionary kid born again as a bright-eyed curious atheist, and I'm on a journey to explore how the world really works using my trustworthy tools of scientific skepticism and critical thinking. If you're new here, I welcome you to smash that subscribe button and come along for the ride. When arguing for the existence of God, we've all seen pastors, apologists, imams, or theologians start by arguing for a first cause that created the universe before leaping to the assumption that that cause must be God, specifically their God. The most notable example of this is William Lane Craig with his Kalam cosmological argument. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist 
Therefore, the universe has a cause. Don't worry, this video isn't about the Kalam and its many problems. Plenty of other channels have already done that, and even the physicists who Craig misquotes have called him out and done a rebuttal. I'll pop a playlist with some of those responses below, but what I want to focus on is what comes next. We'll ignore for the moment the fact that most cosmologists don't actually claim that the universe had a beginning. The expanding era of inflation that we're part of must have a past boundary someplace. That does not necessarily mean the universe had a beginning. That something came from nothing. The Big Bang was not the beginning. There was an eon prior to us, one before that, one before that, etc. Or that the Big Bang was the beginning of everything. The Big Bang theory has absolutely nothing to say about the question of how the universe started. What it does describe is what the universe looked like when it was very much younger. We'll ignore the multiple cyclical universe models, we'll forget about multiverse theory, and of course don't worry about the fact that when you extrapolate the universe's expansion backwards in time, time itself kind of breaks down as space-time becomes infinitely dense, making the word beginning kind of meaningless. Ignore all of that, and let's assume for a moment that apologists know more about cosmology than actual cosmologists. You know. I'm something of a scientist myself. That our universe did indeed have a beginning for sure, and that it did have a cause. The theist still has to get from first cause, which could be two brains colliding together, or a new universe springing into existence as the result of a black hole, or any number of other possibilities. They have to get from there to a conscious first cause, a creator. And then from that to an all-powerful, all-knowing, omnipresent conscious first cause, to their specific omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent conscious first cause, who made all of this with us in mind. But why assume that the Big Bang had to have been triggered by an equally big god? After all, you don't need to be the size of a nuclear blast or have the strength of Godzilla to create or detonate a nuclear bomb. Similarly, why couldn't the creator of our universe be just as mortal and weak as you or I? After all, a stage 4 bone cancer patient in a wheelchair could push a button and level a city. What if our Big Bang was actually triggered by some kind of doomsday device, and our creator in some previous universe was actually a psychotic terrorist who died by triggering the device? But I can already hear some of you revolting in the comments. Stupid atheist! The fundamental constants of the universe are so finely tuned for life that it had to have been the product of design, not some destructive force of terrorism. And I hear you. In fact, I already made an entire video responding to the fine-tuning argument, so I'm not going to get into that here. Instead, let's run with your criticism. Assuming that it is fine-tuned, why can't it be both fine-tuned and destructive? Like an eco-terrorist wiping out a civilization so that nature can re-emerge unhindered. Our new universe could have been masterfully designed, with all of its parameters tweaked such that the new universe would allow for life, but its birth could have wiped out everything in the old universe that got in its way. The main point here is that universe-creating technology doesn't necessarily need to be supernatural. In the book Profiles of the Future, An Inquiry into the Limits of the Possible, Arthur C. Clarke formulated three laws about science and technology, the third of which states that any sufficiently advanced technology would be indistinguishable from magic. Shermer's Law takes it a step further. Any sufficiently advanced extraterrestrial intelligence would be indistinguishable from God. Or here's another scenario. What if the creator of our universe actually was a big, powerful genius, bigger than our entire universe? That alone still wouldn't make it supernatural, omnipotent, or all-knowing. They're just relatively larger. They could still have triggered our Big Bang using advanced technology, creating universes in the same way that ecologists plant trees. Ours would be just one among a countless multitude of others. For all we know, our creator died billions of years ago, and her descendants could have long since forgotten about our world. Oh, and aside from religious indoctrination, why assume that there's just one creator, and not an entire lab, company, or civilization of creators that works together on universe design? possibly as a fuel source. But let's adapt this scenario and take these colossal creators and grant them another divine attribute for a moment. Eternal existence. Basically, they're immortal and invincible. We can even make them all powerful too if you'd like. Regardless of how long they've existed or how powerful they are, if they're that gargantuan, how would they even know that we exist? Our entire solar system would be orders of magnitude smaller to them than electrons are to us. We could be like microscopic bacteria growing on a forgotten science experiment an unintentional byproduct too abysmally tiny for them to even detect. Our universes could be the tiny, fundamental building blocks of their universe. And even if they did specifically create our universe and they could detect us, they would have no reason to care about us specifically, and absolutely no way of interacting with us because they would exist and operate in a world of the very large. Or what if our creators were separated from us by time dilation? Depending on how the laws of physics play out in their wider universe, what if our universe's creators
spheres are affected by relativity and because they're so massive, time moves slower for them. So in the breath of time that it takes to wipe the sweat from their safety glasses, all of human history would race past them, vanishing into extinction before they could even figure out how to tell us not to touch our wieners. To some, the lack of divine guidance and supervision is unthinkably terrifying. And I get it. Independence is a terrifying prospect. But part of growing up is discovering the double-edged beauty of autonomy and self-determination. Now, there's no reason to think that a creator has to be all-knowing or omnipresent or that it has to exist at the scale of our tiny world or care at all about our existence. But there is a scenario where that might be possible. Simulation theory. Whether you've watched The Matrix or seen your fair share of sci-fi, you're probably somewhat familiar with the simulation theory, which posits that the world around us isn't real, but it feels real to our brains, which are hooked up to a simulation. Or we don't have brains and bodies at all and are entirely computer-generated parts of the program. The creators of our simulated universe who are running the program still probably wouldn't be omniscient and would lack awareness of all of the variables, all our thoughts, experiences, and the various events occurring inside the simulation. They would likely just focus on the most important events, the big picture. But the computer would be. Our universe's creators would lack all attributes that we ascribe to the divine, like omniscience, omnipresence, omnibenevolence, etc. But it's the machine running the simulation, which is all-knowing, aware of the status of every single variable. It knows all, sees all, is everywhere at once, even part of the very air that we breathe. But could we really call the computer God? Well, it depends. Is it self-aware? Just because it's simulating a scenario doesn't mean it's freely interacting with it. It's likely just following purely deterministic code. Even if aspects of the world are randomly or pseudo-randomly generated, that doesn't mean that the computer has any say over it whatsoever. And even if it could, can you really call the computer a god if it itself was created? In this scenario, you have a distribution of godlike abilities. It's the computer that's omniscient and omnipresent, but it likely lacks consciousness and the ability to choose. But the programmers who exist outside of our universe's relative time are the ones who are all powerful, who can create new universes, modify the one we live in, or pull the plug altogether at any time. But they're only powerful relative to us. They're relatively divine. Their species still had to evolve naturally, and even if they created us, if they themselves are not the first cause, can we really call them gods? Or are they instead just highly technologically advanced beings indistinguishable to us from gods? While I don't personally think that we're in a simulation, this particular variation of the theory is a better explanation for the problems of evil and suffering than those put forth by religions positing an all-loving god. The god that you serve is too wise to make a mistake, and too loving to be unkind. <laughs> Our source of light gives us cancer, dude. Our simulation's operators could have just gone AFK during the Holocaust, which really begs the question, does God poop? Or he could have us on a thousand X speed just to see how the simulation pans out because he's late for dinner and his wife cooked pot roast. We think we're special, but we could be one of countless other universes. What if our simulation's programmers live in an eternal universe with different laws of physics where their universe is more static than ours and entropy always stays balanced? The entire point of creating our simulation was to make a universe with different laws of physics where pockets of energy could coalesce and life could evolve, but entropy on the whole would always increase, resulting in the eventual heat death of the universe. And elsewhere in their lab, they're simulating a different universe where entropy starts extremely high and always decreases over time, resulting in a great cataclysmic burning. Perhaps life in that universe never has a chance to evolve, in which case we would not expect to find ourselves in that universe, but we would only expect to exist in the universe that allows us to exist. Or what if we ourselves created our universe? Running with the simulation hypothesis, what if the creators of this simulation are currently orbiting around one of the last remaining dying stars in their universe? Unable to stop this process? They could only hope to buy time. So they wiped their memories of their existential terror and entered into a simulation of their own creation where they could live out a million lifetimes in a fraction of a second, experiencing immortality in a slowed down alternate reality. Every time they die, they'd be reincarnated as a different person in the simulation. In essence, we created this simulation ourselves and entered into it, wiping our memories upon entry. And every time we pray to our universe's creator, we're unknowingly whispering words to ourselves. But why would we create a world where we would suffer so much? Perhaps 
as incentive because suffering breeds innovation. It breeds creativity. Maybe we're meant to find a solution, which leads to scenario seven. What if we are R&D, research and development? What if our existence is part of a last ditch effort to reverse entropy? Our universe was created or simulated by a desperate civilization to see if any of the life forms on these many billions of planets could develop a solution to the heat death of their universe? What if we are their hope of reversing entropy? In a way, each of us would be an intelligent node on a gigantic deep learning algorithm with one goal. But right now, we're failing. We're still insufficiently evolved and intellectually infantile, too busy fighting wars and chasing gods of our own making. Now, I do think that some of the biggest problems in our universe and on our planet are worth solving and we shouldn't get distracted from them. But I don't personally think that any of these scenarios for our creation are necessarily true. But the point is that whenever you have to appeal to the existence of a creator to explain how our universe got here, you haven't really answered the question of where everything came from. Instead, you now have two things to explain, how our universe was created and where our creator came from. This isn't a problem for creationists who claim that God is eternal. However, they laugh at the notion that the cosmos could be eternal or could come from nothing, but simultaneously posit an infinitely more complex God that has to be either eternal or to have come from nothing. They cherry pick science when it suits them, claiming that an infinite universe violates the second law of thermodynamics. But you've got to have creation. That's the point. You've got to have creation. The second law of thermodynamics insists on it. But then embrace a God that would also violate the second law law of thermodynamics. On faith, they claim that the laws of physics don't apply to God because he exists outside of our universe. God is eternal. He is outside of the realm of time. But then reject the possibility of any kind of multiverse existing outside of our universe, which naturally follows from string theory, even if it's currently outside of our technological capabilities to measure. Basically, the double standards are endless. Now, these are just a handful among a plethora of possible creator creation scenarios, some more plausible than others. And I'm not saying that you should believe any of them. Just know that it's a lot harder to get from the existence of a creator to the existence of a god than most people realize. And even if you could get all the way there, you now have the tremendously arduous burden of proving that that God is the same God that you believe in. But it's these types of experiments and questions that are worth exploring. They're challenging, they're existential, and they're fun. We should never shy away from scrutinizing an idea simply because we're afraid of the answers that we might find. If it's true, it'll withstand scrutiny. And if it's not, well, then it's not really worth believing in. I'm all for religious freedom, but getting people to ask hard questions, calling out dogma, and pushing back back against fundamentalism is what I do full time with this channel. So if you appreciate that, you enjoyed this video and you want to help me to promote critical thinking and free thought, you can support me and the Holy Kool-Aid team with a donation via any of your favorite payment platforms. Every little bit helps a lot. Or you can make an ongoing per video pledge on Patreon or a monthly pledge on Subscribestar. That said, it's purely optional and my videos will always be free because I want you guys to be able to watch them and enjoy them. If you already support my work, thank you so much. And as always, dare to be curious, but don't drink the Kool-Aid. If you were to ask me to give you just one reason why I'm an atheist, I could probably condense it down to a lack of sufficient evidence for the existence of a god or gods. But if you were to ask me why I'm not a Christian, it would be a lot harder for me to give you just one answer, because the Bible and most Christian interpretations come packed with a plethora of fatal problems. Any one of them is enough to bring the entire house of cards crashing down, but one of them stands above the rest as the most damning catastrophe for the Christian faith. And you don't need a PhD in history or extensive of knowledge about science, religion, or philosophy to see why. And no, it's not the problem of evil or suffering. This is the problem of instruction. Christianity's fatal error. The god of the Christian faith is often referred to as an omni-god, because he's believed by most Christians to be omnipotent or all-powerful, omniscient or all-knowing, omnibenevolent or all-loving, and omnipresent. He's basically everywhere at once. Some apologists prefer the term maximally great. God can be defined as a maximally great being. And in order to be maximally great, a maximally great being would have to be all-powerful, all-knowing, and morally perfect in every possible world. If you assume that this kind of God exists, then you're left with a major problem. The problem of instruction. To understand this conundrum, we first need to start with a hypothetical, a thought experiment. Forget 
everything that you know about the Bible for just a moment and pretend that you're in a hypothetical alternative universe with a different omni-god. If this deity is all-loving, all-knowing, omnipresent, and all-powerful and is trying to communicate the most important message in the universe to his or her children, how would they communicate this vital message? And conversely, if this god either didn't exist at all or turned out to be limited in knowledge, love, power, or locality, what would you expect to see instead? In the first scenario with the Omnigod, you would expect perfect communication. Any decent newspaper editor knows that the average person reads at or below the 8th grade level, and they tailor their paper accordingly, so as to be widely accessible and easily understood. They avoid technical jargon and ambiguous words as much as they possibly can, and they provide clarification and define and explain what they mean when they need to. We should expect that an all-knowing god of the universe who created the brains of their target audience would know this, would know our cognitive and linguistic shortcomings, and would craft this critical message with similar precision. Now, there's a number of reliable ways that this message could be perfectly transmitted. At first I thought maybe God could place enormous, divinely protected plaques all over the world with very literal, extremely clear instructions on them. These plaques would be indestructible and tamper-proof, since what good is a divinely inspired message without divine preservation? As society and language change, the messages could update to ensure maximal clarity, keep up with current events, and meet the needs and answer the questions of God's children, sort of like God's message board. Or he could write a message for all of us to see in the sky, or even on the moon. But then I thought, not everyone's literate, or speaks the same language. Some people are blind, etc. But remember, no challenge is too big for an all-powerful God, and an all-loving God would care enough to overcome this challenge. If God is everywhere at once, he could just tell us his message in person and coach us directly. But some people might argue that his presence would overwhelm us, and while I think that's kind of a cop-out, I do acknowledge the objection. So what if instead each person received God's message in their own language, hand-tailored for them such that it's perfectly communicated in a way that everyone would understand and reach the same conclusion. A message preloaded into everyone's brains, mental firmware that we're all born with. It would come straight from God, not through human authors. It would be directed to all mankind from the get-go, not just to a tiny handful of self-proclaimed chosen people. And there would be no internal inconsistencies in the message, no historical contradictions or scientific inaccuracies. And unlike with a conscience, what we deem as right and wrong wouldn't change from culture to culture, and you wouldn't have psychopaths who lack one altogether. This would be a ubiquitous, accessible, clear and perfect message. Because the communication of a perfect God should be perfect. But what if the alternative was true? What if there's no God at all, or the God slash gods who do exist aren't omni-gods like the God of the Bible? Well, we'd expect to see a very, very different result. We would expect to find wildly different religions popping up all over the world, written by scientifically ignorant ancient authors desperately trying to make sense of their tiny, myopic view of the universe around them. You wouldn't expect to find any supernatural insights about germs, neurochemistry and mental health, heliocentrism, DNA, any knowledge of other galaxies, or any information not already available to their primitive cultures. At best, you might occasionally just get a few lucky guesses here and there. Many, if not most, of these holy books would place humanity at the center and contain stories about human experiences, of violent warlords, superstitions, wild legends, human heroes, and of unseen monsters lurking in the dark. Morality would vary from culture to culture, with some even sacrificing animals or or even fellow humans to the gods. But strangely, no gods would step in to correct these gross misconceptions about their bloodlusts or mentor humanity on right and wrong. Is he asleep? No, no. I'm pretty sure he's dead. Instead, cultures would have to progress morally on their own, because these holy books would be chained to the morality of their time, justifying barbaric practices like slavery, witch burning, because yes, they would still believe in witches, homophobia, sexism, genocide, etc. Of the many religions springing up everywhere, some would fizzle out, while others might be more relatable and would spread more rapidly. They may contain more contagious ideas with stronger sticking power. If you haven't realized already, Christianity is described perfectly 
directly by the latter scenario, in direct conflict with its insistence on the existence of an omnigod, a claim on which the truth of the Bible is entirely contingent. But it gets even worse for Christianity. For those who don't know the history of the Bible, it was concocted millennia before the printing press, video cameras, or the internet, in a small, rural, mostly illiterate backwater by otherwise insignificant goat herders searching for spiritual significance. Its contents were compiled and molded over time like a patchwork of stories with centuries between the events described and when they were actually written down, a multi-generational game of telephone, and centuries more passed before they were finally copied onto our oldest surviving manuscripts. None of our original documents have been divinely preserved. For example, the story of the Exodus, if it did occur, would have happened sometime between the 15th and 13th century BCE. But most scholars don't think it was actually compiled into its current written form until centuries later, sometime between the late 6th and 4th centuries BCE. And our oldest surviving, albeit fragmentary, manuscript of the Exodus dates to no earlier than 250 BCE, about a thousand years after the events described. And it's even worse for the older stories in the Bible contained in, say, the book of Genesis, like Sodom and Gomorrah, or the flood and creation myths. And even the various later manuscripts that have survived are riddled with copying errors, mistakes, and changes between them. Passages have been added and removed. For example, Matthew 18 jumps straight from verse 10 to verse 12. That's weird. And just one chapter earlier, Matthew 17 skips from verse 20 to verse 22. These missing verses weren't in our earliest manuscripts, but were added later and were considered part of the Bible for centuries before we discovered these older manuscripts and edited these verses back out. The same is true for the ending of the Lord's Prayer, although some translations like the King James Version still leave this later edition in, while others don't. By contrast, Matthew 12, 47 also isn't in our earliest New Testament manuscripts and was added later, but unlike with these other examples, this one was never removed. The same is true for the story of the woman caught in adultery. These are just a few of the many known examples of how the Bible has changed over time, and we'll never know the exact number of edits that have occurred since we don't and probably never will have any of the original texts. The Bible is riddled with scientific inaccuracies, internal contradictions, and mistakes where it deviates from the historical record. I've done in-depth videos on all of these things, and that's not to mention the addition of all of the horrifically immoral sanctions contained in its pages. Sure, it's easy for apologists to say that these are all misinterpretations of God's intended message, but doesn't that speak to God's failure as a communicator? Does God not understand the minds of his creation or the importance of clarity? Or is he not capable of clear communication? Unless he doesn't exist exist, isn't present, or doesn't care. No matter how you look at it, this is strong evidence against the God of the Bible. But imagine for a moment that the Bible is true, but all of the verses on, say, slavery in the Bible aren't meant to be taken literally. After all, a benevolent God would never condone something so utterly atrocious. But it's written literally, it's taken literally, and for thousands of years, God sits back and watches, arms folded, as millions of people are enslaved, with his words used as the primary justification for it. And he offers not so much as an amendment or a clarifier. During this time, it would take centuries of Old Testament laws before this perfect, inerrant message would finally get an update, a New Testament. But even with the New Testament, after a thousand years of beta testing his laws, when God could have patched the system with some type of a clarifier about not owning another human being, we would instead get slaves obey your masters, leading to centuries more of religiously sanctioned atrocities. And even if none of that was the case, and this message was completely perfect and had been communicated perfectly, much of the world still doesn't have access to it. Human translators have painstakingly painstakingly tried to translate the Bible into every language on earth, and after thousands of years, their job's still not done. And all the while, linguistic metaphors and figures of speech have inevitably been lost in the process, unintentionally changing the meaning of the text. Which is why, in English alone, there are dozens of different versions of God's inerrant message. A message so nebulous that countless interpretations have emerged from those versions, splintering Christianity into tens of thousands of denominations with entire wars being fought over who's reading it correctly, with 
all the clarity and precision of a Jackson Pollock painting, core doctrines had to be voted on by people interpreting a loose collection of translations of copies of copies of copies, which happened hundreds of years after the stories allegedly took place. And even after all the books in the Bible were finally finished, for centuries there would be no consensus on which of these books were even canonical and should be included in the Bible, and which shouldn't. And even today, there's still some disagreement over this. Theologians, pastors, and apologists have dedicated decades of their lives to desperately attempting to somehow salvage this wreck, crafting books, sermons, and lectures filled with mental gymnastics and riddled with logical fallacies. Although, one thing that most of them agree on is that we don't actually know who wrote most of the books of the Bible. They're anonymous! Now you might be wondering, with a communication problem this massive, how has this disaster spread so far and wide? Well, one way is through emotional trauma and fear, instilling in people the fear of eternal damnation, teaching them that they have a problem before attempting to sell them the cure. It's also been spread at the tip of the sword, forced upon the conquered, on natives and slaves. Generation after generation has indoctrinated their children, teaching them to believe baseless assertions on faith, teaching them that faith is a virtue. Entire countries have adopted Christianity as part of their culture, making it a part of a collective identity, fearing that the alternative was divine wrath here on earth in addition to the eternal torturous hellfire of the hereafter. Fear is an extremely powerful tool. And as for the skeptics who dared to doubt, well, for centuries, non-believers have been denigrated from pulpits everywhere, shunned, demonized, ostracized, and sometimes even killed, all for simply being honest enough to point out a few of these glaring problems. To the atheist watching this telecast, if our belief in God offends you, move. There are planes leaving every hour on the, on the hour, going every place on planet Earth. Get on one. We don't want you, and we won't miss you. I promise you. And the cherry on top of all of this is that the Bible is so long, so convoluted, archaic, and cryptic that most believers have never even read it through cover to cover, because if they did, they would see for themselves exactly what I'm talking about. If this idea is new or interesting to you, or you find some value in the videos that I make and the way that I present them, you can support my work with a per video pledge on patreon.com slash holy kool-aid, a monthly pledge on Subscribestar, or a one-time donation on PayPal. Your support is what allows me to do this full time, to pay my editor, to cover all my equipment costs, my travel costs, research, and all of the time that it takes to make these videos. Without you, this wouldn't be possible. Thank you guys so much for your ongoing support of the show, and as always, Dare to be curious, but don't drink the Kool-Aid. The following contains spoilers from the books The Egg by Andy Weir, The Last Question by Isaac Asimov, and God's Debris by Scott Adams. Hello, Thomas Westbrook here. Have you ever wondered, is God an alien from outer space? Having spent a decade of my life in the Bible Belt of the southern United States, I don't know how many times I've heard people make unsubstantiated supernatural claims and then jump straight to the God of the Bible. I can get somebody saying that probably a God did all this to plug the at least current gaps in their understanding. If you stop there, then you become useless in terms of scientific discovery, but I can understand that. What makes no sense is jumping from there are patterns in the universe to talking donkeys, global floods, ludicrous prophecies, and a 6,000 year old earth. Just off the top of my head, here are five unique God hypotheses more likely than the ones held by most religious adherents. Number one, aliens seeded life on Earth. Arthur C. Clarke's third law states that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And Michael Shermer's variation, any sufficiently advanced extraterrestrial intelligence is indistinguishable from God. It's possible that billions of years ago, aliens seeded life on Earth. In fact, I find it plausible. However, while no one can really disprove this hypothesis, there's no real evidence that this actually happened. And without evidence, the burden of proof lies heavily on the person making the claim. And even if life on Earth did come from aliens, we're still left wondering where they originated from. So we're back to square one. Number two, it's all a simulation. 
Elon Musk has hypothesized that we could very likely be living in an alien simulation. Because as any civilization advances technologically, it's highly likely that at some point they would develop a virtual reality indistinguishable from actual reality. And it's very unlikely that we would be the first ones to develop such a technology meaning it's more likely that we would be the subjects of this experiment than the ones enacting it. Or maybe there's an infinite recursive simulation in a simulation in a simulation. But even Musk finds science and religion incompatible and doesn't believe in God. Can science and religion coexist? Probably not. And this theory doesn't explain the origin of those running the simulation. It's likely that they began in some type of Big Bang themselves. And like the first scenario, there's no real evidence of this. So, if we can't interact with the outside reality or even prove it exists, then as much as I want to know the truth, without any proof of this hypothesis, it shouldn't alter the way we live our lives. Number 3. We are the incubated egg of a future god. Your life, my life, and everyone from Hitler to Jesus are all just reincarnations of the same person. We are merely an egg in the developmental process of becoming a god, and only after we've experienced every single life across time will we actually achieve this end. This hypothesis, while completely unsubstantiated, is actually a far more just universe than the one the Bible claims. Because you not only live as Joseph Stalin, but you also live all the lives of the people he had executed or sent to the Gulag. And in this way, you receive exactly the same amount of cruelty and suffering that you dish out. Number 4. God is a cosmic internet of collective consciousness. As scientific advancement takes humanity from a single planet species to an intergalactic civilization, only one question remains unanswered can entropy reverse itself. As the last star dies out, the last human merges consciousness with the ethereal, interstellar, internet-like supercomputer, answering the question with the words, let there be light, reversing entropy and speaking the universe back into existence. While I find this god hypothesis the most likely of any I've ever heard, it still demands that everything in the universe had a natural starting point, came about without a god, and eventually evolved one. There's no reason to assume that us earthlings aren't in the early stages of becoming the first gods, whatever that means. Number 5. We are the remnants of God's suicide. God is able to do everything, but out of curiosity or boredom, he asks if he's able to kill himself. Being eternal, he eventually decides to give it a try and blows himself up, causing the Big Bang. Just as living cells evolve over time into multicellular organisms in which all of the parts work together to make a greater whole, we are God's debris, slowly reforming itself and evolving back into the divine. This last theory is a bit far-fetched. On the one hand, it doesn't postulate an interactive deity whose interests are caught up in the petty undergoings of meager humans. But like a lot of Eastern religions, it assumes that everything in the universe is somehow connected and that there's some cosmic force that we can't see or measure holding and connecting all of us together. A force that leaves no evidence and scientific equations work perfectly fine without it. Any claim like this would need to put forth some pretty impressive proof in order to be accepted as a plausible theory. And like the other four god hypotheses, and like every other religion ever concocted, it just falls short. Now the possibilities of different types of gods are only limited by human imagination. For example, there could be a highly advanced alien civilization outside our universe that collided two universes together in such a way as to trigger the Big Bang, but they're unable to enter our universe or interact with it, and would most likely even be oblivious to our existence. Maybe they're harnessing the energy created by the Big Bang as a fuel source. Maybe they move through time at a rate relatively slow compared to us, and so to them the Big Bang happened mere seconds ago. The problem with this god belief is I literally just pulled it out of my butt. Just like someone, somewhere, did before me with every religion ever made. If you'd like to check out any of the short stories mentioned in this video, I've put the links to the books in the video description. They're all excellent reads, and trust me, my summaries don't do them justice. Hello, Thomas Westbrook here. Have you ever wondered, is the universe fine-tuned for life? Ah, the fine-tuning argument. The most overused argument in the creationist toolkit. If you're not familiar with the fine-tuning argument, it goes something like this. These are the fundamental constants and quantities of the universe. Scientists have come to the shocking realization that each of these numbers has been carefully dialed to an astonishingly precise value, a value that falls within an exceedingly narrow, life-permitting range. If any one of these numbers were altered by even a hair's breadth, no physical, interactive life of any kind could exist anywhere. 
If the Earth were just 5% closer to the Sun, it would be subject to the same fate as Venus. A runaway greenhouse effect with temperatures rising to nearly 900 degrees Fahrenheit. Conversely, if the Earth were 20% farther from its home star, carbon dioxide clouds would form in its upper atmosphere, initiating the cycle of ice and cold that has sterilized Mars. 5% and 20% don't sound like much, but that window is 37,399,000 kilometers wide. And Earth's orbit isn't a perfect circle either. It varies widely in its distance to the Sun. With over 100 billion galaxies containing 100 billion stars, many of which have multiple planets, ours has at least eight, sorry Pluto, it's not surprising that in just the few years that we've had telescopes and methods to detect them, we've discovered thousands of exoplanets with estimates of as many as 40 billion just in our galaxy that are orbiting around a star in the habitable zone. Now, most of the universe is a dangerous vacuum that's either scorching hot or ice cold, and with no air to breathe, we would die in seconds. In fact, 99.999 ad nauseum percent of the universe is not suitable for human life. And it took us billions of years to evolve and adapt to this narrow corner of it. So to say that the universe is fine-tuned for life is like saying that the Sydney Opera House was fine-tuned for the speck of mold growing on the crumb of cheese that fell from a lady's pocket five minutes ago. Allow me to paint a picture for you of what a universe fine-tuned for life might actually look like. Every star would be surrounded with multiple habitable planets, each in perfect equilibrium and they wouldn't have shifting tectonic plates causing earthquakes or volcanoes. No dangerously sporadic weather conditions would exist, and we would be impervious to UV radiation if it existed at all. There would be a higher ratio of land to water, and a greater percentage of the water would be drinkable. The requirements for human life wouldn't be so minuscule and tiny. We'd possibly even be able to survive in outer space and explore it with ease. And while this type of universe may not be able to operate on its own according to our current laws of physics, it wouldn't have to, because it would be held in place by God. The very fact that our universe always adheres to physical constants and operates so well on its own is proof in itself that God is superfluous. We live on a tiny rock, hurtling around a massive fireball at death-defying speeds in the vacuum of space. Our planet is bombarded by meteors and asteroids, encompassed with natural disasters, and has undergone at least five known mass extinction events. Our primary source of light and energy gives us cancer. Only a fool would say that this planet is intelligently designed. Only a blind lunatic would call it fine-tuned for human life when everything around us is trying to wipe us out. But even though it's not fine-tuned for life, the parameters for life aren't nearly as narrow as we once thought. In the 19th century, it was speculated that man could not survive speeds greater than 50 miles per hour. To show just how laughable that assumption is, astronauts on the Apollo 11 reached speeds of 24,790 miles per hour. Creationists think that the window for life is so tiny. But let's take a look at the tardigrade. This little guy can survive temperatures as low as minus 328 degrees Fahrenheit. That's minus 200 Celsius. And as high as 300 degrees Fahrenheit, or 148.8 Celsius. Radiation? No problemo. They can take doses a thousand times the lethal dose for humans, and can live on in pressures 6,000 times higher than that of our atmosphere. And we've even found other bacteria that can survive in outer space. The fact is, we just don't know what the limits of life are. Sure, we've adapted to this planet, but the requirements for life in other circumstances may be broader than we ever thought possible. If we'd been born in a hotter planet, we would have likely evolved from thermophiles and would have evolved better cooling mechanisms or internal systems that thrive in heat. Would you then say that that planet is so fine-tuned for life? But what about the constants of the universe? The force of gravity is determined by the gravitational constant. If this constant varied by just one in 10 to the 60th parts, none of us would exist. That seems pretty crazy, but here's what an actual physicist has to say about it. There's a famous example that theists like to give, or even cosmologists who haven't thought about it enough, that the expansion rate of the early universe is tuned to within one part in 10 to the 60th. That's the naive estimate back of the envelope, pencil, and paper you would do. But in this case, you can do better. You can go into the equations of general relativity, and there is a correct, rigorous derivation of the probability. And when you ask the same question using the correct equations, you find that the probability is 1. All but a set of measure 0 of early universe cosmologies have the right expansion rate to live for a long time and allow life to exist. Or here's another one. Consider the expansion rate of the universe. This is driven by the cosmological constant 
A change in its value by a mere one part in 10 to the 120th parts would cause the universe to expand too rapidly or too slowly. In either case, the universe would again be life prohibiting. One of the worst fine tuning problems in nature, which is the one I, one of the ones I first proposed, the cosmological constant problem, the dark energy in the universe, the Greek biggest mystery of the universe, that looks like it's incredibly fine tuned, 120 orders of magnitude, the worst fine tuning problem in nature. And Dr. Craig will jump up and say, look, if it was a lot bigger, we wouldn't have humans. Well, it turns out if it was precisely zero, which is a much more natural number, more life would form. What about the electroweak force? Well, it turns out it appears fine-tuned if that's the only value we're permitted to alter. But work by Dr. Harnick and colleagues has demonstrated a perfectly viable universe when allowed to tweak other parameters simultaneously, even in the complete absence of the weak force altogether. And if you're concerned with probability, there's no reason to assume that the universe hasn't been expanding and contracting for eternity, or that our universe isn't one of many. The Cosmological Natural Selection Theory by physicist Lee Smolin posits that black holes may be the way that universes reproduce, each new universe having slightly different physical constants. If that's the case, and there's an infinite number of universes, then even if the creationist assertions about the improbability of life were true, probability would be irrelevant. Because even if the chance of life was really one in a trillion trillion, then with more than a trillion trillion universes, each with different physical constants, our existence would be a statistical necessity. But rather than our universe being fine-tuned for life, it would be fine-tuned for the formation of black holes. Which, given the prevalence of black holes, it certainly appears to be. The universes that don't produce black holes would die out, and the ones that produce the most would become more common. The fact that some of the mass formed would evolve into human life would be an inconsequential byproduct. We inhabit an incomprehensibly tiny speck floating through vast emptiness and chaos. Are we really so arrogantly egocentric as to look up at the night sky and assume that it's all made for us? Is that really a crutch we need to make it through the day? Starting in extreme conditions, humans and our ancient non-human ancestors adapted to this planet as it cooled. Those of us who couldn't live long enough to reproduce were lost along the way. We have evolved to survive here, fine-tuning ourselves to this planet, not the other way around. We have fought tooth and nail to get to where we are. That's all the more reason to cherish this life and not squander it or destroy the only home we have. If our universe is intelligently designed, why didn't God make seals that rape penguins? Hello, Thomas Westbrook here. Have you ever wondered, isn't atheism risky? What if you're wrong? In the mid-1600s, mathematician Blaise Pascal posited the following paraphrased argument for belief in God. If God exists, it's far safer to believe in him. The rewards are eternal, and if you're wrong, you lose nothing. But if you don't believe in the wrong, the cost is too great. There are so many things wrong with Pascal's wager that I'm always surprised that people still use it today. First off, he assumes that you can choose what you believe. If I don't see evidence for God, I can't choose to believe one exists any more than I can choose to believe that my friend Danny is an Xbox controller. I can lie and say I do, but even if I did, an all-knowing God would see right through me, and would probably appreciate an honest lack of belief far more than insincere bet hedging. And with over 4,000 known gods mankind has concocted, what makes you think you're worshipping the right one, and not just the one you like? Sure, a billion Protestants and Catholics really dig their god, but all us passing out virgins and the Mormons came up with one that gives you a planet when you die. His popularity is really taken off. What if you're praying to the wrong god, and every time you go to church and tithe, you're just pissing her off? If a god created the universe, I think he'd be confident enough to get by just fine without perpetual brown nosing. He wouldn't go hungry without prayers, and he wouldn't need an ego boost. It's incredibly arrogant to think that a god capable of creating this universe would be entirely centered around our small planet, and more specifically, me. And if it's so crucial that you believe, wouldn't an omniscient, loving god reveal himself to you in a targeted way that he knows will convince you? Doubt-free, naive belief without evidence is such a dumb way to determine salvation anyways, especially for the hide-and-seek champion of the universe. I certainly don't believe in the Christian god any more than I do the Egyptian, Norse, or Aztec gods. Yahweh and Allah are just a flavor of the month. With all their failed prophecies, internal scriptural contradictions, scientific and historical inaccuracies, and sanctioning of immoral acts of violence, choosing one of these deities would be one of the worst, most illogical choices anyone could make. And the stakes get even higher when you add science to the equation. 
We have no empirical proof of God. Every supernatural claim that has been thoroughly tested has been thoroughly debunked. Our understanding of the cosmos is light years ahead of what it used to be even just 10 years ago and is growing exponentially every day as we gather more data and unlock better ways to observe the universe. Whether you've kept up with it or not, scientists independently across multiple disciplines have been piecing together the origins of life in the universe from a hundred trillionths of a second after the Big Bang, to the formation of stars and planets, to abiogenesis and the evolution of life itself. Everything points to a universe from nothing, and the gaps for God are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Adding an even more complex God to the mix only complicates the equation with unnecessary and unproven assumptions. So tell me, with every god we know of being pitifully small and man-made, and as the possibility for any deity shrinks to a minuscule afterthought, does it really make sense to take this bet? And it's not without cost. If following and serving one of these gods means wasting precious time in this short and singular life, if it means diverting time and money away from scientific advancement and towards regressive religious institutions, if it means throwing our lives away in a holy grail style quest for the non-existent, or allowing for suffering, division, and bigotry in hopes of an increasingly unlikely divine reward, then the cost to take this wager is far higher than anyone in their right mind should be willing to take. It would be like selling your family for an already scratched off lottery ticket from a guy in an unmarked van who swears it's the winning ticket. Sure, we can't know with 100% certainty that no god exists, and for that reason we should all technically be agnostic. But due to the sheer improbability of it, I give no more credence to the Judeo-Christian god than to Odin or Osiris. In regards to how I live my life, I'm an atheist towards all gods. They're all highly improbable. As an agnostic atheist, I create my own purpose and carve my own path. Live a good life. There probably is no God. And if there is, and she's just, then your humanism and sincere quest for truth, love, and the betterment of others will be enough. And if there's not a God, it's still enough. Do good for its own sake, because we're good people. Let's make this world better because we want to live in a better world, not because we're scared little worms hedging a bet. Please like and share this, and support me on Patreon if you can. Y'all rock. Don't waste your only life, and don't drink the Kool-Aid. Imagine for a moment that the major world religions as we know them are different. Imagine that you're a member of the largest religion on earth, and the core of your ideology resides in the belief that the world was created by an all-powerful bean farmer and is residing on a sacred giant bean sprout. All beans are sacred. This one belief will trickle into all areas of your life. The thought of eating a can of Wonder Beans will feel repulsively sacrilegious to you. Anyone who draws a picture of a bean would be a blasphemous apostate deserving of death. Warring factions of your religion might argue with each other over whether or not it's okay to eat unripe beans because they're not yet a viable life. Your preconceived faith-based notions about cosmology, the origins of life, and even the shape of the earth would get in the way of any scientific progress you might otherwise make, and the mere thought of questioning these ideas would be held sinful. Doubt not the sacred bean master, lest he plant you in his magical sprout's molten roots. This dogma, spread by missionaries and relayed through generations, eventually would seep into every area of culture. The ramifications of social issues would be discussed not in practical or utilitarian terms, but rather in the context of the Book of the Bean. In order to actually have a productive conversation about anything, you would first have to shatter this root misconception about reality. A fundamental paradigm shift would be necessary in order to make any progress in conversations about tangential issues. And until you become able to take a step back and critically examine the validity of that one core belief, people can attempt to change your mind on social issues, but they will see little progress. Because your positions on these points are deeply rooted in an emotionally held fundamental misconception about reality. Unfortunately, this misconception would have become so entrenched in your identity that questioning it may trigger an identity crisis. But every good science experiment leaves room for falsifiability, and this core idea should be questioned. If it's true, testing it won't alter that reality. This is why I rarely argue over social issues on my channel. I've wanted to make a video on the science of conception and abortion for some time now, and I probably still will, but if someone literally believes in a doctrine that implies ensoulment upon conception, 
Little ground can be made dissuading them from that idea as long as it's based in a literal interpretation of their holy book. No productive conversations can be made over what stage or under what circumstances an abortion may or may not be appropriate. Without a paradigm shift, two people from opposing positions can discuss exactly the same topic and present exactly the same data and both come away more entrenched in their ideas. Each carry their presupposition into the argument, each target the branches and not the roots. But when your worldview shifts, Every position you hold suddenly needs to be reevaluated based on newfound realizations. That is why I target religion. That is why I promote scientific skepticism and critical thinking. Because without this change, no change. And with it, all the rest will follow. Dare to be curious, but don't drink the Kool-Aid.